Hello and welcome everybody to At World's Edge, the World Horror Fantasy Podcast, where we're going to be talking today about one of the greatest events in the Warhammer world's history, the War of the Beard. Uh, thank you for everyone who was a little bit patient with me. I actually made this a week ago and then deleted it. So also, a shameless plug for always saving your work. With, all, with that said, let's jump right in. The War of Vengeance, otherwise known as the War of the Beard, is the as the uh, war that really took the um, that changed the course of the entire Warhammer world, taking place about uh, about a thousand years, about sorry, two thousand years before Sigmar uh, came onto the came onto the world stage and founded the Empire. It, sh it took the empires of the elves and dwarves from the height of their power and their dominance in the world, in the uh, old world, and really brought it to its knees. At the end of the day, it is the greatest story of hubris and, uh, and well, pride uh, and uh, inflexibility in the Warhammer universe. So we're going to be talking about that today. It'll, uh, we're going to go through the war itself, as well as some things that happened in it, because, um, you know, it's a great source of uh, it's a great source of stories for your Warhammer games. It also provides a lot of in-depth knowledge about why the elves and dwarves don't get along in the war in the Warhammer world, as opposed to say, the Lord of the Rings world, where we're really not given a whole lot of information there, and certainly other ones like World of Warcraft and um, and Witcher, where the the their relations aren't nearly as fleshed out. So as as far as lores go, war of the uh, the War of Vengeance or the War of the Beard definitely gives us a, a much clearer picture of these two uh, great races. So, let's go all the way back, though, before they were enemies. In the beginning, the great incursion against chaos occur uh, from chaos occurred when the polar gates of the Old Ones collapsed and chaos spilled into the world. Both elves and dwarves had to face these cre these uh, incursions. Uh, they were designed by the Old Ones to do so, in in to stand up against chaos in their own way. The elves, because of their intense affinity to magic, and the dwarves, because of their intense resistance to it. They were uh, in the uh, at the very last battle of the incursion against chaos was fought in the very north of the Karazankor, or the Dwarven Empire, by Malekith and Snorri Whitebeard, uh, the king of the High King of the Dwarves and the Prince of uh, Ulthuan at the time. He'd already given up his control to Belshinar at this point. But they were fast friends and allies at this point in history, and would stay so for many millennia. Uh, in fact, the friendship forged by Malekith and Snorri would be one of the great friendships in the Warhammer world, made even more sour by the eventual betrayal of Malekith, as we'll discuss later. So, fast forward to about 1500 uh, uh, pre-imperial uh, calendar, and the Karazhan Corps is living in a golden age. This is when we'll see the greatest um, actions of the dwarves, the greatest uh, artifices of the dwarves put in um, put into reality. Their great holds are all at the height of their power. Their population is immense, and their artistry is at the point where it's it can only get worse from here. Which is a theme for the dwarves. We do. It isn't just the uh, war of the beard that changes things forever for the dwarves as far as their quality and their knowledge, but it certainly doesn't help anything at this point. The course of history could have very well been pro dwarves. It could have been very, uh, very different than what we see in the end times. Um, if you'll notice on the map, we do have a ton of non-broken holds. So all of these here are broken at the time of the uh, at the time of the end times. Um, Karaza Karak and Karak Kadrin are still around, but Varn. Uh, these guys don't even exist. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, he's gone. Uh, yeah, they, uh, pretty much it's it's Karak Hearn, Karaza Karak, Karak Kadrin, and Karak Azul in the future maps. And yeah, I'm sorry, Barak Var is there too. So let's talk a little bit about nomenclature while we're on the map here, real quick. So Karaz, I mean Kar uh, Karaz Angkor refers to the entirety of the Dwarven kingdoms. So that would be this term up here. But Karak, K-A-R-A-K, is what we're talking about when you're hearing a mountain hold. Kazad, which doesn't really exist at the time that most people are familiar with the game, is a above ground or a Skaranawi, so sky dwarf holds. These are the dwarves that live 
in like a, a what would almost be considered a human settlement. Um, of course, it's it's dwarven, but it's it's above ground. They farm, they have cattle, you know, all those good things that people do above ground. And barrack is a seahold. Um, if you keep those those general words in mind, you'll be good to go. Um, but yeah, so that the dwarven empire at this point is at its absolute best place. And part of that is because of the alliance with the elves, who are also at their golden age. Um, the Ulf one itself, while they've already gone through the sundering and they've had a horrible incident like that, um, where their, their population was split down, um, we have to remember that was centuries in the past. And since that time, they have repaired Ulfwan itself. The land is beautiful and built up. It's um, there are wizards and uh, dra and dragon princes are uh, able to ply their craft with a, a skill that they won't see in the future. And their navy has expanded immensely, not just and within Ulfwan or projecting Ulfwan's power, but also founding colonies all over the uh, Warhammer world. Many of the names you're familiar with from the Warhammer uh, Total War series are from this particular time period, um, it's when they were founded, for all, both with the goal of protecting the world against chaos and pirates, which was always a purpose. They have that whole um, 19th, early 20th century British world policeman thing going on, but also to, for commercial reasons, the great the elves were mercantilist. Um, they were not yet, uh, the Finnabar, the Seafarer being from Lothurn, they weren't quite that, mili um, mercantilist, and their capital was actually in Kalidor at Torquilad, uh, um, and their king being Fen uh, Kalidor II, so the grandson of Kalidor the um, Dragon Tamer and the son of Kalidor I. But at this point, the elves were uh, magically more powerful than ever before. Their alliances with the dragons and the griffins and, um, and uh, e great eagles were unparalleled, and it can't be overstated. The alliance of the dwarves and elves made each other stronger. Going back to that same map, this is the map. This is the uh, uh, these are the settlements that were inhabited by elves and dwarves, and you'll notice many of them are very close to each other. Obviously, the dwarves are more in the mountains over here, um, so that that's that's certainly uh, going to stay the same for you know the rest of the Warhammer world. That's not going to change. But there's also these settlements that are very close to each other, where the dwarves would mine and the elves would sell. Zakbar Varf was actually an entirely new type of settlement um, where dwarves and elves lived in equal measure. We also know from, uh, from the record that dwarves helped build the foundations of many of the elven, uh, the great elven cities of the old world. So it's not that elves and dwarves were just living alongside each other. They were actively benefiting from each other. Um, Elfin Arvan, which is a word many are not familiar with from the current lore, is the name of the elven colonies in the Old World. Throughout the, the story War of Vengeance and in pretty much every army book, the dwarves refer to the Old World as the Old World. Um, they wouldn't really have called it that, I don't think, because they didn't have a new world to compare it to, but um, the elves make very clear uh, in the elven language that this is Elfin Arvan, and it was a complete... Uh, it was completely built on the hopes for the future. It was that they were going to, there was only pretty much scattered tribes of beast men, and of course, goblins from the mountains. But really at this point, in, in this exact moment in history, Gotrek Starbreaker had already cleared the, this entire area of greenskins. It was actually the, his claim to fame for his reign was wiping out the greenskins, and that's a whole campaign in and of itself. And Beastmen, of course, um, because chaos has ebbed at this point, so it's at its low uh, its low point, there isn't really a huge chaos uh, Beastmen threat, or chaos in general. And the, um, you know, the combined patrols of, de of dwarves and elves that walk the, uh, the roads of this area would have kept that at bay. Um, one of the fun things you will notice about this map, and I'm, this is, of course, on purpose by the... Uh, by the developers is that many of the names of cities on here, um, while the names are completely different, they are some of the cities that we, their locations, uh, so the foundations of the cities we see in the old, in the um, 
uh, in the maps of the Old World as we know them in both Old World and in Warhammer Fantasy. Toralesi became Languil of uh, Bretonia, Sithrionsic became Marienburg, Corvinach is the exact location where Altdorf sits, Athelmoria is Talapheim, um, and all of the, uh, and the, the Dwarven holds, they don't need any introduction, but it is interesting that they chose to make the some of the greatest cities in the old world um, built on elven foundations. So why do these people go to war then? Well, at the end of the day, war, war never changes. And racial tensions between the elves and dwarves were never, uh, never easy. The elves and dwarves, as built by the old ones, were almost diametrically opposed. The dwarves were uh, short and stout. The elves were tall and lithe. Dwarves lived underground. Elves lived in the sky. Both were incredibly uncomfortable in general with those, uh, with those, um, each other's living spaces. Even the Skaranawi, the sky dwarves, weren't really in the sky. They were still as low to the ground as possible and also even dug into the ground to build their holds, just not in the mountains, uh, more at ground level. The dwarves were great uh, f makers of things. They, they made objects, they built the mountain holds. Elves were much more in tune with growing things. Now, it is a point made in the story War of Vengeance that in shaping a growing thing, is that not just as perverse as building it of stone? And that's a solid argument. The elves came to the New World, colonized it, or sorry, to Elf and Arvon, their New World, colonized it, and immediately shaped the trees and plants to their liking. Is that any different than building a hold and, ca and carving it out of the mountains? I don't really know. That's a philosophical discussion. Um, there's also the fear of change, and this is more on the dwarves' part, um, because the change was more elves coming into the old world. This was dwarven land, and it wasn't, and it was really more that the elves coming in and um, that increased interaction, the change in culture, that was really more of a symptom, especially older dwarves. As we hear Reynold Silverthumb and some of, and the high kings of the Rinkaz, which is the gathering of high kings, talk about a lot is that things are changing. The world is not the, they're afraid of elves moving in and taking something from them. Not taking land because they're all at peace and they're, they both profit from that peace as far as trade is concerned. So from an economic standpoint, from a military standpoint, it's only good to have more have elves and dwarves closer to each other. But they're all uneasy because the culture is changing. Um, something that we can all agree, we can all relate to from our modern world, even if it's not something we feel ourselves. We see that all the time. And then the fantasy element, the dark elves, uh, the the drukai or the, the druki or the dark elves actually very much sparked the war of vengeance. Um, this is not a, uh, and this is this is agreed upon by all groups, uh, by all sources, the army books, the books, um, and the, sorry, the army books and the novels all agree that the War of the Beard was sparked by the Druki, but it really wouldn't have happened without the underlying racial tensions and fear of change that accompanied the, the war. People wouldn't have been so willing to murder each other. So how did that war actually begin? Well, we come to the last Rinkaz, and this isn't the last, um, you know, in history. We just don't know after this. It's not a word we really hear in the army books, but a Rinkaz is a, gr is a gathering of the kings. Gotrek Starbreaker, as I said, the, and the leader of the Karazhan Corps, was at the height of his power at this point, and so were the rest of the dwarves. Unlike in today's world where a Rinkaz would only be able to... Um, you know, capture a few, get a few holds to a comp to uh, join because, well, they don't really exist anymore. The Rinkaz of uh, Gotrek uh, Starbreaker was a, was uh, attended by kings from as far south as Karakazul and as far north as Krakadrak, um, and even had a representative from Karak Zorn, though. We know that that representative was a Zinchin demon. What we don't know is what we do. What we also can surmise, and also from later entries in the War of the Beard, from talking about what Gotrek expects correspondence to look like, they expected Karak Zorn to attend, and they had regular contact with it. So at this point, it is not the lost hold of Karak Zorn. Um, it is the hold of Karak Zorn that's real, real far away, and nobody really talks to them much. 
but they did expect some communications sometimes. So that's interesting. We also know from, I believe, the Skaven Army book, maybe 8th edition, that Karak Zorn was in contact until the, not Skaven, I'm sorry, Lizardmen, that Karak Zorn did have contact until about 2500, um, uh, until uh, 2000 ICE, which would actually match up with the, uh, with the timeline for the War of the Beard. So between 2500 and, tw and 2000 ICE, Karak Zorn disappears. That type of um, timeline wouldn't have mattered to the dwarves because they're very long lived. A few centuries being out of contact with something so far away wouldn't be weird to them. And of course, Krakadrak hasn't been destroyed by chaos yet. Um, all of these holds here, Kadrin, Zufbar, Azul, um, Draz, Eight Peaks, uh, Zufbar, and uh, Ungor, uh, Ungor, Vlag, um, have not fallen yet to chaos, and they are very much alive and well and able to send massive armies to the uh, Dwarven High King when he asks. So what's going on here? The items they're discussing are the King King Grum of Karakazul, oh, sorry, <laughs> Karakazul, of Kazad Crow. Um, so he does feature into the story. He is the king and he styles himself High King with the throne with the throne bearers and everything of the Skaranawi. So Kazad Crow, Kazad Mingul, Kazad Thar, um, the dwarves that live above the uh, mountains. And he is styling himself High King in the same way that the High King of Krakadrak does, except whereas Krakadrak at this time understands that Gotrek uh, Stormbreaker and the High King of Karazak Krak uh, supersedes them all. Um, Krom is trying to break away. We don't really know if he's trying to break away because he feels that the Skaranawi aren't treated well, um, uh, treated as equals, which they're not. They're treated with suspicion and a little bit of derision by their mountain uh, their mountain cousins. Or if he's just greedy, which we know he suffers from yellow fever, which is the, uh, the greed um, disease that comes uh, with too much gold. And it's kind of referenced in Lord of the Rings also as what the, um, what the kings of, uh, uh, Erebor suffered uh, towards the end of their reign. Um, they discuss trade because everyone likes a good trade story. It's like Phantom Menace all over again. And the dwarves were happy with the uh, uh, with the trade coming out of uh, coming out of the relationship with the elves, and especially K uh, Karak is real, which became Karak Asgal later, was famous for trading with the elves. But really, they all benefited. It is said that the toys of the dwar the clockwork toys of the dwarves, clockwork toys of the dwarves, were the delight of elven of elven children. We know from the army books that several of the greatest items made by the uh, that used by elven princes were made by dwarves, and the dwarves, for their part were rich on the trade. They, everyone was happy about this, and trade was actually one of the big items against war with elves. But at the end of the day, when dwarves are wronged, there's only one answer. And when Agrin Firebeard was murdered, he was the high rune lord of Barak Var, and one of the oldest in, uh, rune lords in existence, um, the High King did call an end to all trade with the elves, because at the end of the day, we can't, uh, they they didn't want to go to war yet. Gotrek Starbreaker was very reluctant to go to war uh, because he knew what it would do to his people and the elves as well, and he wasn't a foolish ruler. He'd already seen extensive bloodshed against the Greenskins, which were an entirely different enemy. But he did, um, he did cut off trade, hoping that it would force the issue and placate his people and also punish the elves. Unfortunately, he was wrong. So what do elven armies look like at this point? So what are, what are the dwarves facing? What did the elves have on the table? Well, the dwarves were mostly familiar with these guys up here, the colonial militia of Elthen Arvon. Um, it is comprised of um, militia bowmen, militia spearmen, and silverhelms. Silverhelms representing the lower nobility that, rep that uh, ruled in the Elthen Arvon. Um, you have to remember, just like other colonies in our world, um, the colonies in, in the old world from the elves were made up of people who didn't quite fit in in elf one either because they were secretly dark elf sympathizers or because they were just petty nobles and needed to petty being small not being mean-spirited petty nobles who needed to get out from under their parents thumb but they the armies of elf and arvon were not the grand armies that we know from 
you know, the elves that we play or the elves that we saw fighting chaos at millennia before. So when the dwarves come into the picture, they're expecting these guys to face these inexperienced, non-professional armies of citizen soldiers. What the elves really had was back in Ulthuan and also in Nagarond fighting the Dark Elves, which it's also important to note, the elves did not tell the dwarves at all of this strife. Um, they make it very clear, both from the dwarven and elven perspectives, that the dwarves don't really understand the Druki or how, how they could break apart that much. But they already have knowledge of the Dawizar, and they also fight with themselves, so I'm not really sure how that plays out, but in any case, the elves kept their war in Nagarond a secret, um, so the dwarves not only didn't really understand the full power of the elven armies, which were made up of elite Lothurn Seaguard um, so, and uh, supported by Tyrannoch chariots. There were, of course, more archers and more spearmen and more silver helms, but these were the things that the dwarves were not familiar with. So their strategy seemed to be most of the time to perform harrying actions with the chariots, while the Lothurn Sea Guard would pepper them with ar with archer with um, arrows until they met in combat. Where of course Lothurn Sea Guard are also adept at fighting. They're supported long range by the uh, very by the famous Skyclaw bolt throwers and their mages, both of which operate as supporting um, fire for their infantry armies. However, the real might of the Asur is in their relationships with their uh, with other creatures from Althuan. Griffins, at this point, are not just the purview of lords and heroes, but also knights. They have whole knights of griffins that we mentioned at the Battle of Oregor. Um, the great eagles are great allies to the elves, um, both as riders, so they can um, get messages back and forth, and also as monsters that can tear into an artillery piece. And of course, the piece de resistance is the dragon knights of Kalidor. Unlike dragon princes in the end times and the uh, and the old world, these dragon princes rode dragons, and not just rode them. They were the they were the um, they were partners with them. It wasn't a relationship of a rider and his horse. It was more of a relationship of peers who became stronger as they uh, as they fought together, as they lived together, um, and it. it it was a it was a alliance that while it didn't really break would never be the same after the war. Um, as I mentioned before, the elves at this time are led by uh, Kalidor II, um, with a great who has a great family name and is an accomplished personal combatant, but is infinitely stupid and vain. Um, one of the uh, notes that is very clear is that he does not make good command decisions himself, and he does not hire. Good commanders. He picks them because of their favoritism at court, which is something that actually came into play. I think it was in seventh edition of uh, Elves, where you could um, have bad rulers, bad uh, heroes, because they were uh, politically chosen instead of militarily chosen. But every, but he continually appoints bad uh, military leaders, both in Nagarond and in the colonies, which does not help the situation as the Elves are routinely routed by the dwarves. Dwarves, on the surface, for their part, look very similar to what you're used to in the old world, but their numbers are huge. Um, having only a few hundred dwarves in an army makes it large at the time of the end times, but we're not talking about a few hundred in an army. We're talking thousands upon thousands. Um, and also, because the dwarves had just recently eradicated the greenskins, they were immensely experienced. There were, their uh, typical um, line of battle seems to have been dwarven infantry of the warrior caste, so the, the lower, um, lower uh, younger, less experienced, augmented by longbeards, who are their veteran soldiers, supported by quarrelers. Dwarves didn't use arrows, they used um, bolts, uh, so they had to be a little bit closer because of the shorter range, but they would be in close support with each other. Um, in addition to these, their leaders fought typically at the front in the middle of their um, armies rather than leading from afar, and they'd be supported by their uh, elite hammer or um, uh, hammer regiments, or heavily armored and heavily armed. Dwarven artillery was, um, they talk about trebuchets, bolt throwers, um, grudge throwers, and even more esoteric uh, type, uh, not esoteric, eccentric types of machines that the Engineers Guild has cooked up. 
engineers for their part went along with the sieges and with the uh, battles so that they could provide practical experience and had several battles in the War of the Beard. The presence of engineers changed the course of the battle. Um, in the auxiliary, they were supported by such things as the berserkers of uh, Krakadrak, so proto-slayers, um, and also rangers who fought above ground and would do um, harrying actions and scouting for the dwarves. Uh, one of the favorite um, strategies of the dwarves was to attack from one side and then also have their armies come up from below. These would be led by their minor regiments and then supported by um, iron breakers. Again, these numbers, it can't be stated, are huge at this time. There's no shortage of manpower in the Karaz Angkor. They haven't suffered millennia of being killed by goblins. They are at the height of their power, and all of this is supported by runecraft. Runes are not rare in the War of the Beard. They are on everything. They are on helmets and shields and axes and even little trinkets. There are the rune lore, the rune lore so the, the, the knowledge of how to make runes um, is much more prevalent because there are simply more runesmiths and rune lords. They haven't yet become frontline fighters, so they aren't being murdered off. And they're closer to their ancestors, both in understanding and in time. So there is less knowledge lost, and that becomes very clear when they are fighting. So the war began. Um, in earnest, uh, when the when the prince of the uh, dwarves, Snorri Halfhand, known be, uh, known as such because half his hand was bitten off by an unknown race at the time, which we now know as the Skaven, uh, began his uh, actually began before Gotrek Starbreaker was approving the war, and led his armies um, and gathered his armies at Blackfire Pass. They actually burned down Corvaneth and then led the army all the way to Torilesi, where they promptly were defeated by the elves. Um, the Torilesi is the capital of Elthenarvon. It's the greatest city that the elves created, and it is largely impregnable, um, even to the citizen soldiers of the elves. Uh, the elves actually destroyed the uh, army there and, the, and then harried the dwarves all the way back to their mountain kingdoms. So the first phase of the war could be said the dwarves drive the elves back, drive towards the sea. They go straight to Torlesi. They ignore everything else, with the exception of that um, that excursion to Corvaneth, and they are pushed back. Um, this is the first time dwarves fight dragons. Um, Morgrim Ironbeard says that the dragons were, and he was as prideful a dwarf as they come, but the dragons simply were something they had no answer for. Their greatest rune lore couldn't stop it. It wasn't balanced. It wasn't built for that yet. Their bolts and um, and artillery would bounce off the skin of the of the uh, dragons. Uh, the dragons were largely immune to fire, whereas dwarves could be resistant to fire because of runes, but they couldn't escape it forever. And the power that a star or moon dragon was bringing to bear was just vastly, vastly different than the um, the tiny comparatively tiny dragons that they fought in the World's Edge Mountains. So the, the elves pushed them back, um, back not all the way to the mountains, but back away from Torlesi and also away from their larger settlements. The dwarves then changed tactic and went after the smaller outposts. So the, the little things labeled as outposts um, would, be, uh, would be where they would be aiming towards. They also fought uh, eventually so a couple of centuries in, at um, the Khazads. So we would see Khazad Mingle and Khazad Thar uh, attacked by dragons as well, and by the elves by extension. The dwarves took back took what they could, wiping out uh, Origor, which was the um, private land of Prince Imladric, and also several of the outposts along the way. Now you'll notice I'm not really focusing on the individual names. Snorri, uh, Snorri Halfhand was murdered by Kalidor II, which was a major factor in the dwarves going to war. Imladric um, and Morgrim were great friends prior to the war and did try to keep the, to, uh, to stop the conflict before it came out. And there are a host of great heroes throughout both sides, um, Brock Stonefist and Lord Salandar, um, Lady Leandra of the High Elves. Uh, there's there's so many. We could even name all the High Kings because they all have their names in here too. 
But at the end of the day, I don't view the War of Vengeance as a war of people. It was a war of inexorable forces moving towards each other. And while people, of course, make a difference, it was almost as if their best efforts could not have stopped it any more than a single person's efforts could have caused it. So the war eventually became an issue of the elves have a, have an, and have a tool that the dwarves cannot face, and the elves, for their part, really can't break into the mountain holds. Even a dragon cannot attack a mountain. So things had to evolve. As we've seen in our own wars, war uh, begets innovation. So the, uh, the elves, at uh, about a midway through the war, not even midway, probably in the first third, the dragons abandoned them. This is partially because Prince Im Imladric was killed, but also because dragons, again, as I said, are not mounts to be ridden. They are allies and need to be, they need to be convinced to be in this war, or they need to find a reason to do it themselves. Initially, they came because the elves are their, are their allies, and they asked them, and they knew this was important to them, but they got tired of this war. They thought it was petty and foolish and left. But that didn't mean the elves couldn't find dragons. Using the fell fangs, which is a tool that you might be familiar with from uh, Warhammer Roleplay, um, they enslaved local dragons, such as Malok, the destroyer. And then when that wasn't even enough for them, they enslaved merworms. Enslaved is the key word here because the creatures know it themselves as well. Um, essentially, by wearing a fell fang, the rider uh, became uh, one in one with the dragon but not the same way as they were with the Dragon Prince, which is a relationship built on mutual um, mutual need and uh, mutual appreciation of each other. This was built on domination. The dwarves, for their part, took to the sky for the first time with the first uh, uh, Harbaz sky, uh, yeah, with the first uh, Thunder Barges. Um, they do have a dwarven name who I will fail to pronounce. I've already done a couple takes here. Um, but the Dwarven airships were the, were the uh, creation of Barak Vars engineers, and they took to the sky for the first time. Warp fire was used by the Dwarves for the first time. Under the influence of Thrain Drogar of Karak Zorn, later to be discovered as a Zinchin demon from the, uh, from the in first incursion of chaos, um, warp fire was loaded onto the both the ships of Barakvar and also the airships of Barakvar, and fired at dragons where it did murder several of them. And finally, the runecraft of the dwarves was uh, was taken from being a high art to being just another piece of battlefield artillery. Anvils of Doom had been taken to battle before, but never in these numbers. Um, and they were over and over again. Some of them were even purposefully exploded in order to break down the, seat, the walls of uh, Toralesi, which is a uh, an abomination and a great shame that should never have happened. It would have never been something acceptable by earlier generations of rune lords. But at this point, the war had created a new type of dwarf that didn't value the same honor and tradition as their ancestors. Phase three of the war, as I'm calling it, was the bloodletting. It was the long period of uh, the, after the first century of the war and into the uh, as we're coming up to the fifth, where there was just ruin and destruction. Elf, um, the elves, unable to get into the mountains, would make piercing attacks, uh, or sorry, sweeping attacks all throughout the old world, basically wiping out dwarven settlements and caravans. The dwarves, for their part, would attempt to assail Toralesi over and over again and fail. There was uh, 13 sieges of Toralesi before it was successful. The final phase of the war, which I'm calling Wrath and Ruin, was the tipping point after the after the bloodletting of centuries, where the the land was essentially bled dry. We saw several important um, locations fail all at once. Barakvar was destroyed by Zinch. Um, he actual uh, the in the actual story, the fleet of Barakvar was was going out to meet the High Elves who had besieged them for now several centuries um, to push them out and claim victory. The Z uh, Thrain Drogar had convinced the ship to be laden with warp fire weapons, and then the entire fleet exploded destroying the hold of Barakvar. Not the entire hold, the people still lived, it was inside of the mountains, but the seaport of Barakvar, the, the port that makes them important, was gone. 
Um, Barak Var, it's important to note because it, it'll come into play, was a contender for leadership of the dwarves um, versus Karaza Karak. So wealthy and powerful and populous was it that Barak Var, as well as Karak Eight Peaks um, at the Last Rinkas, were both seen as options for Gotrek Starbreaker if he was a little too uh, easy on the elves. For their part, the elves went back and burnt Corvanath again, which the elves had repopulated. They also destroyed Athel Moriah, which was the, the final resting place of Brock Stonefist and Lord Salandar. And they completely destroyed Sithrionic. Sithrionic is particularly uh, sad for the, uh, for the old world itself, because as people who play Empire right now, or play Total War, know that that area is called the Wasteland. It's a land of darkness, fen, marshes, and in general, just desolation. Prior to the War of the Beard, or you know, the elves had built that area into a paradise that mimicked Ulthuan itself. Um, vineyards, orchards, uh, forests. It was it was a an air. It was almost heaven on earth. It was also the largest trading post in the world, um, maintaining contacts with uh, Ulthuan as well as Barak Var. The dwarves would tear it down stone by stone in recompense for Barakvar, which they blame on the elves because they don't know about the Zinchin demon, and also because at the end of the day, Barakvar was uh, besieged for centuries, and it really was the elves who caused that downfall. With uh, with the rest of the uh, with the rest of the uh, elven colonies destroyed, it comes down to the 14th siege of Torilesi. In this siege, Kalidor II, again, for the first time since the beginning of the war and his murder of Snorri Halfhand, takes personal command of his forces. This is a measure of extreme arrogance because it's not as if showing up there was going to militarily allow the, the elves to, to jump out. They still had a vast military uh, disadvantage. But he felt that if he was there, he would be able to show his, his generals the right way to do things. It was arrogance that would come with a price, as Gotrek Starbreaker uh, utterly destroyed the Elven King after hours of personal combat. It is said that the two, uh, the two beings represented the very um, epitome of each of their races, with Kalidor striking back with enchanted weapons, uh, with speed and, uh, and precision whereas the Dwarven King's armor was nearly impenetrable, and his, uh, his um, stubbornness and refusal to tire made him an enemy the elf simply could not overcome. In the end, Kalidor did beg for his life, promising everything and more that the dwarves had asked for, and the dwarf disgustingly uh, uh, killed him with his axe and then took the crown from his head. The phoenix crown still resides in Karaza Karak up until its destruction in the war, in the, um, in the uh, end times. So what happened after this? Well, the elves left the old world. They left everything behind. Um, and in reality, that, that, that was probably one of the bigger effects, but it wasn't the only thing. The reason they actually left and didn't even attempt to go back and get the Phoenix crown from the dwarves or continue the war um, with vengeance from their side was because the, the Dark Elves, who of course had started this whole thing from the beginning, took that moment to attempt to re-raise the fortress of, of Anlac in Nacarith and begin their invasion of Ulthuan for the first time since the Sundering. This required all of the uh, Elven armies from around the world to be pulled back, which inadvertently led to the growth, to the birth of Wood Elves, almost a new Sundering, as the, um, the Asir and the Ianir both broke off from the uh, High Elves of Ulthuan at this point. Um, the book actually has a fascinating um, way that the elves, uh, the wood elves, were to, um, grew, and it contra contradicts a little bit with the army books, but not much. You can you can definitely make it work in your head. Um, but one of the but the very last um, battle, as it were, to be fought was actually the destruction of the high king of Karak Eight Peaks as he went to um, assail the city that would become the uh, area that would become Lorelorn. Um, and the elves there, in their first alliance with the trees of the of the woodland realms, um, woke up the trees and then crushed the dwarves, uh, an entire dwarven army, under the uh, under the shades of those um, of those trees. The uh, as far as the dwarves go, they actually won the war of the beard by any metric imaginable. They won the war, but it didn't do them any good. Not 50 years after the uh, last elves look, um, 
left the old world before all the armies had even fully returned, the underway was racked by a series of earthquakes. Unknown to uh, the dwarves, the Skaven in Skaven Blight had attempted a great creation of engineering, and it exploded um, because it was built by the Skaven, causing um, massive earthquakes and also volcanoes. The earthquakes damaged the dwarven realm, but they could have fixed that, especially had they had elven help. Unfortunately, the great volcanoes that were blown up in the east through, um, forced a migration of ogres and orcs and goblins from the far east and into the world's edge mountains, an invasion they were not prepared for because the underway was destroyed and their armies were so vastly depleted by the War of the Beard. For this was followed up by Skaven, which for the first time were a force. Remember, Snorri Halfhand was bitten by a Skaven, but at that point everyone pretty much thought he was he was a little crazy, seeing maybe a creature of chaos or a monster in the deep. Um, it was really only the king of Karak Isril, which was one of the uh, first holds to fall and become Karak Asgal, that really understood what he was facing, and the warnings went unheeded. The dwarves would spend the rest of their existence on the back foot. They would never again regain pre preeminence and would always be seen as a tragic example of fighting a lost cause. So that leads us to speculation. What if this hadn't happened? What if the War of the Beard had been avoided by the, uh, whether the, the Dark Elves had failed, whether Imladric had succeeded in his peacekeeping? Just what if? Well, the Elves and Dwarves, as created by the Old Ones, represented together a perfect yin and yang that would protect the Old World, or protect the entire world, from the machinations of chaos. They would uh, succeed the lizard men as protectors of that world and, cre um, and create a perfect circle of protection. Elven uh, speed and precision and magic, uh, as well as immortality, combined with dwarven tenacity, resistance to magic, and craftsmanship, um, would have created both defense and offense. Um, it's well, it would be well understood that even as men did gain an ascendance and did grow up, they would be under the tutelage of the elves and dwarves. So it's possible they would have never actually uh, fully evolved because the elves would have certainly looked down on them and seen them as lesser, and the dwarves also to some extent, because even though they need them as allies and they see them as valuable, they do see them as a lesser, uh, lesser group. So by the time of the end times, if that even would have happened, but by that the period of time, we would have possibly just seen a greater elven and dwarven empire, dwarves stretching from the very north where they were a bastion against chaos to the very south where they were also a bastion against chaos, supporting the elves as they were around their various colonies in the world. Um, with, of course, the, the young race of men under both of them huddled in Bretonia, and things like the orcs and goblins and beastmen probably eradicated. It would have been a world vastly different and maybe not one in which war never ends. Well, this was a very long, I think this was the longest one I ever created. So thank you so much for sticking with me on this. Um, I look forward to uh, making more such videos and please let me know in the bottom. The comments have been very helpful to try and uh, improve my craft. Um, so thank you again. Please click like, share, and subscribe and you all have a great day.